Good evening. I'm Catherine Aiken, Dean of the College of Letters, Arts, and Social Sciences. It's my very great pleasure to welcome you to the Distinguished Humanities Professor Lecture. The Humanities Endowment in the College of Letters, Arts, and Social Science was the brainchild and vision of Kurt Olson, Dean of the then College of Letters and Science. In 1991, he secured a grant from the National Endowment for the Humanities and then set about raising the required matching funds for that grant. He was successful in doing that, and as a result, we have over a million dollar endowment in the college that is designed to increase awareness of humanities disciplines and to improve humanities teaching. We have been, for the last decade and a half, the beneficiaries, in my opinion, as a university community of the creative genius, no less, of members of the College of Letters, Arts, and Social Science, of their conviction that the humanities are important. They are, after all, the study of how we interact with one another, and more importantly, of what makes us human. And there's nothing more important than that, in my opinion. What I especially embrace and celebrate about this program is that faculty are given the resources to actually make their dreams and imaginations a reality. And the results have run the gamut in terms of programming and topics with the similarities in that they have been early examples of interdisciplinarity before that was a catchword at our university. They have been clear efforts that demonstrate imagination and innovation. They have greatly altered the nature of our academic community, dare I say transformed our academic community. And they have provided us with considerable joy and intellectual stimulation, which I especially like. There's nothing to say that humanities and intellectual efforts can't be fun as well as, as interesting and engaging. This year, we have the second of the Distinguished Humanities Professors, following in the wake of the inaugural Distinguished Humanities Professor Gary Williams is not easy, but my friend and colleague Rodney Fry has risen to the occasion. Fry came to the University of Idaho in 1998. He is an ethnographer and distinguished member of the Department of Sociology and Anthropology. We have known him in all these years as a person whose quiet grace and commitment reminds us not only of the importance of difference and diversity and those perspectives, but how central it is to identifying um, ourselves as well as, as others. He is the author of several books that you can read about on the website. Most of us in this room have been the beneficiary of his mesmerizing storytelling and of his various pieces of expertise related to indigenous people in this entire region. His topic for his year as Distinguished Humanities Professor emphasizes the significance of the interplay between the particular diverse and unique and the shared universal and ubiquitous. I don't get to say ubiquitous very often, so I just might say it again, the ubiquitous. This evening, his lecture is entitled Turning of the Wheel, Meeting the Challenges and Charting Creating the World with Spokes and Hubs. I can't tell you how delighted I am to introduce my friend and colleague, Rodney Fry. He's very generous. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dean Aiken. That was more than generous. First things first. <laughs> and it was a brand new coat. Sorry, Chris. 
But she did get me this beautiful tie today to begin, so I'll make up for it. Well, good evening. I'm really humbled and honored to follow in the footsteps of so many great faculty. And, and Gary Williams, we want to acknowledge the great example he set for us in 2007 and 2008. And for his vision, Kurt Olson, for helping bring this all together. There are many, many people here, many friends, and I appreciate that, who are making this possible. It's Tom Yellowtail that you will meet in a few minutes, and his wife Susie, that I need to owe a great gratitude to as well. Uh, Crow elders that have been part of my teaching, part of my learning all these years, along with Cliff Sijon and his wife Lori and their family. Um, Josiah Pinkham and his family. There's so many that have been important to allowing me to get to this place. And certainly I want to acknowledge my, my wife, Christine, that the steps that I have gone have, have been important. But all the many friends here, and I really appreciate this, this turnout this evening. Um, without your help, I would not be here. So thank you. As an ethnographer working with Native peoples, stories are really important. And as uh, Dean Aiken suggested, storytelling is something that I've picked up from many great teachers among the Crow and Coeur Lane and others. So we're going to share some stories this evening, stories of wagon wheels and spokes and a hub, stories about communication and collaboration and building community, stories that go to how we go about communicating and creating, how we build our world, stories that hopefully will resonate with you, stories that you can reflect upon as you leave this warmed hall this evening, and stories that have launched a humanities exploration, some 30 events, and you've got the schedule before you. We couldn't put it up on here, it's on the website, but many wonderful events to follow in the wake of this evening, so we're really honored for that purpose. But before we get to some stories, or Perhaps it is the first story. We need to do some gathering of huckleberries. Huckleberries, as I've come to learn among the Indian peoples of this land, are extremely important in their traditional and contemporary diet. There's a lot of work that goes into it. Fixing the baskets, knowing exactly when to go to the mountain, the care in pulling those berries from the bush so as not to harm the bush and then of cherishing those berries, packing them away in a basket, caring for those berries, those cherished berries. And then when you get down here, going amongst those who couldn't make it up there to the hill, couldn't make it to the mountain, and sharing that fruit, sharing that nourishment with those who couldn't make it. Now, typically, um, um, I've had Cliff Sijon come to class, and he was going to be here, but he's a little under the weather tonight. And we, he would come to class and talk about the huckleberries, the gathering of the huckleberries, how important it was to his family, things I just said. But he'd always turn it on my students. He would always turn it on them and say, you know, your education is a gathering of the huckleberries. Your textbooks are huckleberries. Your instructors, your peers, the experiences you have in and out of the classroom are a gathering of the huckleberries. Cherish the huckleberries. Pack them away in your baskets. And that future date that you need to pull a huckleberry out for someone who's in trouble, someone's being challenged, maybe you're challenged, pull out those huckleberries for them. All about education. He would say, cherish your huckleberries. We never know when we might get knocked off our path get challenged in some way, stumble, fall, yourself, maybe a loved one. We never know. And how each of us responds to that challenge is going to be unique as there are unique people in this auditorium this evening, as there are unique wheels, or excuse me, spokes in that, that wheel, all unique. But each of us will pursue that challenge in our own unique way, distinct from everybody else. Tonight, this is, happens to be my story, my unique story. In December of 2005, I was diagnosed with Hodgkin's lymphoma. I was a fit, I thought, 55. 
uh, professionally active, engaged at the university, had a, a loving family, um, thought the world was just beginning. And all that came to a creech, you know, just a screeching little stop there. I, I, what happened? Something was in the road. It knocked me off my path. I couldn't continue. I had to respond. I had to navigate a dark territory. Soon after, I was having lunch with Cliff, uh, an elder, as I mentioned, with the Coeur d'Alene tribe, a spiritual leader, a, a bro. And as we were having lunch, Cliff suggested a path to navigate that dark territory. He suggested to me, pay attention to both the external healing, your oncologists, your surgeon, your nurses, all those with what he called head knowledge. You need them. Put your trust in them. But it's also your responsibility, knowing where I was coming from, to pay attention to the internal healing as well. Something you have to take responsibility for, that internal healing, what he called heart knowledge. You need both, Fry. Take on both. Well, as I've come over the years to understand head knowledge and heart knowledge from Cliff and from Tom Yellowtail and so many other elders, as I have been involved in my own spiritual course in the Sundance way among the Crow, and as I've taught research methods and done a little research myself, I've come to understand this particular set of knowledge in its own unique way. Something that we're pretty familiar with, most of us, is that of head knowledge. It's premised on material reductionism, on a Cartesian dualism, expressed in the scientific method. Um, this is the world of a lot of great men, sort of godfathers of science, certainly starting with Aristotle, Descartes, Descartes bringing us the Cartesian dualism, the importance of objectivity, Descartes bringing us also the method of deductive logical reasoning, John Locke providing us with the importance of empirical inductive reasoning, Galileo following Pythagoras, understanding nature as chunks of discernible items, of statistically viable items, that the language of nature is mathematics, all reducible to mathematics. Of Isaac Newton searching for those universal laws, laws that would help explain and understand and predict laws of motion. Bacon, who brought us a utilitarianism, that the application of science is to benefit humans. Together, collectively, these stories have brought the scientific method to bear that's so important in understanding um, our world around us. A tangible world of discrete, quantifiable objects viewed as if behind a glass pane, binary opposites devoid of spirit. An important, important understanding of the world. Head knowledge. Pay attention to it, Cliff said. But there's also heart knowledge, in this particular case, representing a different set of principles distinct from head knowledge. Spiritual animation, as expressed by the Crow term Bachve, or the Coeur d'Alene term Sumesh. A linkage, a holism, a unity, as expressed in the Crow term Ashimal Echia, and others. This is a world, this is a story, this is a story of an omnipresent creator, Akbadidiya, the maker of all things, or a Matkin, the one who sits on the mountain. This is, this is the world of many peoples, lots of peoples, of human peoples, animal peoples, plant peoples, rock, spirit peoples, past, present, first peoples. This is a, this is a story of coyote and crane, of rabbit and jackrabbit. This is a story of chief child of the yellow root and how they went about this place before the coming of human peoples, overcoming the monsters, the man-eaters, preparing the world for the coming of human peoples, these first peoples, inundating it with all the things that human peoples would eventually need, the foods, how to clothe ourselves, and the lessons to live in this world. This is the world of deer and, and, and salmon, brothers, that when you gather them, when you go for them, they only allow themselves to be taken by consent. By a gift to them, they offer themselves to you. This is the world in the act of retelling these stories or re-singing these stories or re-dancing these stories. That world comes alive again, perpetuated, renewed. As Cliff would say, when those stories are told, those songs are sung, coyotes there dancing around you. 
cranes over here, chipmunks here, speaking to you, talking to you. You listening, you dance with them, swirling around, and you see the Indian medicine right there, right before you, the power of the Indian medicine. They all come alive as if a thousand years ago, you're present with them now. No distinction, he would say. And hence the expression, the crows have dashushua, that which comes through the mouth has a power to affect the world. Hence the expression, stories that make the world. So then when coyotes chasing that rock, the rock chasing coyote, they're playing on that Rathdrum prairie, and that rock goes into Lake Coeur d'Alene, covered in the blue of the huckleberries, the blue of Lake Coeur d'Alene comes forth. And when a boy runs through camp and his story is told, a healing story comes from that telling. This is a very different world. It's a very transitory world, co-created at the convergence of those participating. It's an event. There's no glass pane here. It's always unfolding of kinship imbued with spirit. Contrasting ways to view the world, certainly contrasting ways to know the world. And Cliff said, pay attention to both, Fry. But they're so contradictory. They're so mutually exclusive. Yeah, slides, PowerPoints. This head knowledge and heart knowledge got best conveyed to me, and, and as you've seen it, as we drive south, just as we enter the Nez Perce Reservation. As you're going along the Clearwater there, you'll see rock formations. You'll see eroded beds. You'll see a powerful river. You'll understand it scientifically of geological processes at work. But can you also understand it as the work of Coyote and the Creator? And right here, pictured here, is the story of two rabbits working together, cooperating together to ambush a rabbit, a story in the landscape. And when that story is retold, that landscape comes alive. So contrasting. And Cliff said, pay attention to both. And then on the immediate level, there was the action and reaction of scalpels and chemo drugs, head knowledge. Yet the pulsating through an eagle feather, heart knowledge. And Cliff said, pay attention to both. How is it, and even in your life, as you go forth, dealing with someone who is in your community, in your workplace, in your class, who seems so distinct, so different. How do you go about communicating with someone so distinct and different? How do you go about collaborating with someone so distinct? Where do we look for guidance? Where do we go? What huckleberries should we pull out? For me, in my story, it goes back to the 1970s. I began work with the crow, the absoloki, um, children of the large beak bird in, in Montana. My project, I just finished my master's degree, and I was working on a project that involved assisting uh, the crow uh, with communication with their Indian Health Service physicians. The doctors were, were well taught, very skilled, but young, and had an inability to communicate, particularly with the elders or the more traditional of the tribe. And they asked if I would come in and work with their elders to put together just a short essay on how the crows themselves understood illness and disease, how they understood it to help the doctors better communicate with their patients. In the course of that, that field work, I was introduced to so many wonderful people and experiences, indeed a way of creating the world. And one of the things that was just marvelous, uncanny, was seemingly the ability of individuals to travel distinct paths in life, to be a traditional sun dancer or a peyote person, and to be a Baptist, to be a registered nurse, a doctor in the hospital, to be coyote, to be a self-effacing elder. So many contrasting ways, jumping between each and the other. And this ambidextrous way of behaving was so wonderfully illustrated in the lives of Tom and Susie Yellowtail, who I had the great pleasure of, of living with for a number of years, and they being my teachers for so many. Tom himself was the main Sundance chief for the tribe, an Akbalia, 
one who heals, a medicine person, always in demand. But he was a devout Baptist as well. He would go to the little brown church, would read the Gospels and know and pray to Jesus Christ as strongly as he did to Akbar at Dia. And then there was his wife, Susie Yellowtail, the first American Indian registered nurse in this country, studying in Boston, working all of her life in the Indian Health Service facility in, in a world of head knowledge. But she was also a sun dancer, also used the feathers. They jumped back and forth. They never brought the, the stethoscope into the Sundance, never brought the eagle feathers, in a sense, into the little brown church. They kept them distinct, but they participated so beautifully in all those communities together. Susie herself was a, on several presidential commissions and traveled and represented the people so wonderfully. This summarized for me this this moment of the ability to jump between different spokes, different ways, effortlessly, was wonderfully represented in 1993 when Tom was invited to Chicago for the 100th anniversary of the Parliament of World Religions. There, over 8,000 representatives from the world's religions, Buddhism, Hinduism, Taoism, Christianity, Islam, Judaism, and the indigenous religions of this land. And there on the podium, speaking in his own language, right beside the Dalai Lama was Tom in full regalia. All of them bridging differences, so many differences, but so many similarities as well. And over the years, Tom had become one of my most prominent teachers. In the course of a conversation I had with him, I asked him about this ability. And he offered this imagery, an imagery that he felt I could understand, I could relate to. He said, the world is like a great wagon wheel. All these spokes represent the distinct religions, traditions of the world, own languages, own ways of doing things, all important. If that wheel is to turn, he'd say, all the spokes need to be there. You can't take some away, you can't add some, you can't extend some. All those spokes are needed. But nevertheless, they're all linked to the same hub, enclosed by that same rim, keeping that wheel tight. And in so doing, the wheel turns. And of course, this imagery was really paramount for him. Uh, to the south of his home in Wyola on the Bighorns is the rock medicine wheel, an ancient place high in the Bighorn Mountains, there's this medicine wheel, some 80 feet across, some 28 spokes, and a cairn of rock in the middle, the wheel. And for Tom and so many others, it was Burnt Face, a young boy who had been badly scarred, fell into a fire pit, deformed his face just with this terrible disfigurement went through life isolated and eventually went to these hills and in his way, in his traditional way, offered up gifts of rock to make that medicine wheel, offering to whomever might come to him. The image of the Sundance Lodge itself from the, the, the point of view of that eagle flying overhead is certainly that of, of the wheel, of the spokes and the hub. Um, that image is so apparent in the dancers. Each dancer, 120 dancers in that lodge for three, sometimes four days without food and water, giving of themselves for a loved one, their intention to help someone else, each dancing at their own pace, each distinct from the others as they charge the center pole with their eagle bone whistle blowing to that drum, dancing back, charging and dancing back, each at their own pace, distinct, but yet all united under that center pole where the eagle and the buffalo head look down, where the center is, they pray through to the creator. All that unison of the drum beat and the whistle keeping them tightly together. The term for the sun dance is ashkishi, which means imitation lodge, an imitation, a reflection a duplication of a larger something, a microcosm of a macrocosm, of dancers unique, of dancers distinct, of dancers diverse, but all united, all in unison, and definitely the wagon wheel. 
So that wheel is something very critical to Tom and his way of thinking about the world. Providing a map, providing a way to get out of that world without dilemma, to be able to navigate and not make an either-or choice, to chart a course for you. Um, as long as you recognize the distinction of each of the spokes, as long as you recognize how they're united together. And so, so for Tom, that, that definitely is a map, a way to chart the world, that wagon wheel, without dilemma, embedded with values of inclusion, interconnection, equality, the seemingly irreconcilable, the distinct, can be, in fact, bridged. But importantly for Tom and Susie, as they navigated this world, they needed a sense of knowing that world. They needed a competency. It's not just enough to respect the different spokes, but to engage them with effective communication, effective collaboration, to know the context to be a devout Christian, a sincere Sundancer, a skilled nurse, a spiritual healer, knowing that context. It took hard work, capabilities to be able to communicate with Baptist parishioners and Sundance participants and Indian Health Service practitioners. Subtle language differences to build those communities of the Little Brown Church, the Sundance Lodge, and the Indian Health Service. So what do we have here? We've got some wagon wheels and rock medicine wheels. We've got some Sundance um, um, practitioners and Baptist parishioners and IH, Indian Health Service um, practitioners, parishioners, sorry, spokes and hubs, the interplay of the unique and universal, huckleberries, and Cliff said, pay attention to both head and heart knowledge. And in my own healing journey, my un unfolding story, indeed the map acted as a map, a means to meet the challenges and chart the path, a huckleberry to nourish, to be able to simultaneously bridge and travel what seemed to be mutually exclusive. I was able to travel the spoke of my Indian names, Eagle Feathers, the Sundance Way, and Heart Knowledge, while at the same time the spoke of chemotherapy and radiation, a stem cell transplant without discord, dis discord. I was able to do that with competency in the Sundance way and the Western biomedical way. I danced, or should I say, reclined with that IV of chemo drugs and that spirit of the buffalo. As Cliff said, pay a particular attention to your internal healing. As I went through this journey, there was a story that Tom had shared that was so important, a story of a young boy a young boy who's running through camp there, not careful where he places his feet. He stumbles and falls, and there where his face lands, those hot coals burn that face badly. He's badly burnt. He's taken to his lodge, he's worked on, but in the wake of that burn, there's a deep scar, a deep scar. And for me, it was a body infested with some malignant cells. And out of that confusion for burnt face, he came forth from his lodge, seeking his relatives, seeking his help. And we, we, we gather around him, we look at him, we look at his face, and someone yells out, hey, that's burnt face, hey, that's burnt face. And his head goes down, and he goes back into his lodge to isolate himself from the ridicule and rejection of others. And for me, it was perhaps the awkwardness of, of friends not knowing quite what to say when you have cancer, or perhaps undergoing sort of um, following the chemo, going incognito as my bushy eyebrows were gone. So was much of my identity. So there was kind of a, a, a solitude in both journeys. But quickly, it was family and friends that offered support, loving support, prayers and preparations. And there was a journey for both. For burnt face, that journey meant going to the bighorns, as we've mentioned, and fasting up there for so many days without food and water, of taking out that, that pipe and putting that tobacco in there to offer a prayer each day to whomever might come to him, to whomever might be with him on that, that journey, of moving those rocks around, those rocks representing his sincerity, 
his devotion, his humility, moving those rocks around each day to form that medicine wheel as a gift to whomever, an offering. My own journey meant going to Lewiston and then to Seattle for chemotherapy and radiation and the side effects that they brought forth, as well as a stem cell transplant, always augmenting on my journey my own rocks, my own gifts, my own sincerity as I went forth, not unlike burnt face, holding tight to what I most cherished, my Indian names, Magoch Shijilish, seeking to help others, a name that Tom, in a bundle ceremony when he brought me into his family, gave me, or Kwakwilski Ki, Little Red Hawk, the name that Cliff gave me when he brought me into his family, or during my fourth Sundance, Bash, Bashli, Buffalo, these were offered in this journey. And as Grandpa told the story, that unfolding story of burnt faith, there's no guarantees that he would come down, no guarantees of success. But using our favorite word, possibility of transformation, the possibility of that. The little people had been watching over him, watching him, seeing how sincere he was. And the little people, the Awakuri, they came to burnt face and they came to him, adopted him as medicine fathers and took that face and made it as if a child's face again. And through the process I went through, I was reborn as a child, the malignant cells destroyed. Following the stem cell procedure, in fact, all my immunity was lost. Um, something important was lost, so I had a series of shots. In fact, just about a month ago, I had my measles and mumps vaccination. It was interesting, uh, during that stem cell transplant in 2009, immediately following it, something else was lost too, but something else realized. I went, underwent this heavy dose of chemotherapy and radiation as part of this process to purge the cancer from my system. As a result, my bone marrow was also totally compromised, shut down, no longer producing the life-giving fluids I would need, red blood cells, platelets, things that we need to survive. I was at a threshold that none of us want to get to. For about eight, 10 days there, I was in this, and I don't know any other word to talk about it, but this liminal period, sort of betwixt and between, where things weren't quite normal, quite routine in my life betwixt and between, a rare opportunity, I think, to deeply listen, moving aside, removing aside all those extraneous distractions, mundane sensibilities and concerns to see what was really important. All I can say, during that time period, something vital could be sensed. And out of that chaos, out of that liminality, for me, wasn't anxiety, wasn't fear, wasn't apprehension, but this crystal clear sense of, ap uh, of empathy and compassion. I, it was like my heart was just coming out as I would still continue with my IV, walk the halls with others going on a similar course as myself and some in a different direction. And, and just, just as I went amongst them, my heart just reached out to them. Just this aching, wanting to help, feeling what they were going through this outpouring of care, this innate connectedness. It's difficult to put into words, and I don't want to try to intellectualize it, but it had something to do with placing myself in their position, something to do with that, and somehow wanting to give, I couldn't give much, but wanting to give unselfishly for them. And in doing so, other and self, me, them, those distinctions became quite blurred. And throughout my healing journey, I was able to certainly to some degree, travel the spokes with competency. But I think there was something else going on here. There was a hub and there was a rim. I could, with my oncologists and my nurses, um, travel that road, certainly, their head knowledge ways. And certainly, with the Akbalia and much of my family, I could travel that heart knowledge, distinct as they were, but yet so clearly they extended a face of empathy and care and compassion. That pat on the back coming from that doctor in a white coat and that pat on the back from an eagle feather held in hand by an akbalia can so penetrate. 
And I'm reminded that so many of the great traditions in this, this land, in this world, diverse in so many ways, Hinduism, Buddhism, Christianity, Muslims, the face and hand of divinity, the face and hand of the ultimate, the infinite, is so much empathy and compassion. And in reflection, going back, thinking of those moments when people, strangers, perfect strangers would show up as I was living with Tom and Susie. People would drive in seeking Tom's help. And I'll never forget all those instances where Tom would, would so deeply listen, would project himself almost into that person, that perfect stranger, and whatever affliction, challenges he had so completely that he would assume that pain or that suffering in that place where that person was. And then maybe a few hours later during a bundle ceremony with that eagle feather, being able to take that hand, that feather, and penetrate that body and pull that from them and tossing it to the east. Such empathy, such compassion. Nineteen seventy four, and I think in reflection there was also another Huckleberry offered, another Huckleberry of the hub. Let me just see where this takes us. I still remember my very first meeting with Tom. Uh, I set up an appointment. Uh, he was more than eager to work on this project, as I had mentioned before, with the Indian Health Service Hospital. And when I got down there, Tom was working with his pigs. The pigs were big. The pigs were nasty. They were dirty. And they always seemed to escape from whatever well-constructed pen he was devising. And I always remember that Tom was talking to these beasts in such a nice, compassionate way, such a peaceful way, such a gentle way. And I soon learned that Tom talked to his own grandkids in that same voice, a gentle, compassionate way. And very soon, we struck up a conversation in one of those moments where you just realize, you just have this feeling, we've known each other for so long as if we've always known each other. We had such rapport almost immediately, even though our backgrounds were so distinct. He, 45 years older than myself, traditional Native American, very rural, very spiritual, I was brought up this white dude, middle class Denver, so far away from his world, but yet we could relate. And how is it? I asked, how is it? And you've had these experiences yourselves when someone you see like you've just known that person forever and you've just met, and yet you're so different, but you, you so relate almost effortlessly. How can that be the case? I asked the question. The crows have a word for storytelling, bai jiji wau, bai jiji wau, which literally means retelling one's own. Now, the way the crows put this together, if you're to tell a cherished story like coyote stories, important stories of creation and perpetuation, you have to have the right to do so. You just can't go out and tell these stories. So there's a particular procedure, a particular etiquette involved. But there's also the understanding retelling one's own, that when something important happens in your life, some major event, some transformation, some challenge is addressed, some reward is given, distinguished humanity, telling that story, you have to go back. It's your responsibility to go back among family and friends and retell the story. Certainly in the burnt face story that, that Tom shared, Burnt Face goes back, and the first thing he does is retell the story to everyone present, his family. And in so doing, reintegrating himself with the community, redefining himself in his community vis-a-vis -vis what had just happened. And importantly, from the Crow perspective, the gifts that came to Burnt Face on his journey, the gifts that come to you in your own stories, as you reshare those gifts, you gift them to others. You give them to others. They become part of everyone's story as a result of that. For Tom and myself, of course, it was the power of story that also united us. Despite our separations, it brought us together and allowed us to converse so easily. 
this kid and this, this elder. Stories that um, are narratives, to be sure, long narratives. Tom's burnt face story, we clocked it because we had to put it on a CD once. 45 minutes, long stories, some even longer than that. Poetry, stories in song, stories in dance, stories represented on your dance regalia, stories everywhere. Oral traditions and one's own stories, stories of heroes and tricksters and quests and sorrows and joys and humor. We trusted each other so well. But these were stories that also meant developing a skill, a competency to listen and to tell the stories, to listen deeply with your heart, with honesty and humility, as Tom did when those perfect strangers showed up, how intensely he listened to their story, to listen so akin to empathy itself, listening, projecting yourself into the story, that unfolding story. And then, when you have the right to retell that story, telling it with heart and life in a manner that welcomes everyone, welcomes each of you into the story as a participant, projected into the story, if you will. So through the stories, we cried and we laughed with remarkable affinity. And of course, in reflection, it was stories like Burnt Face and a shorter story like The Wagon Wheel that allowed me to transverse the mutually exclusive in, in our lives, to bridge so much. And I suspect, if you haven't gotten it already, this evening is a Bae Gigi Wau, is a retelling of my story, and hopefully redefining who we are together in so doing. And hopefully there might be a huckleberry in what we've shared through Tom and Cliff for you this evening, something that you can add to your basket. Well, certainly the wagon wheel and story and empathy have influenced so much of what I've done professionally in my life. As an ethnographer working with Indian peoples for over 35 years, um, I'm so indebted to them as a teacher, as a researcher, as an ethnographer. And I guess the distilled definition of ethnographer is what? Someone who tries to understand somebody else and then retell their story, something that many of us like to do and hopefully doing it with competency. And so as I've gone out in my life and tried to work with indigenous peoples, doing so always in collaboration with my host, they helping design that which we do, representing their culture in their way from their perspective, respecting cultural property rights, doing so in collaboration and permission, and then of always retelling their story in a way that assists them, making sure that our projects are applied. And throughout all my teaching, all my research, the interplay of the unique and the universal, the diverse and the shared in common, have found themselves playing, them out, playing themselves out in a, just a, a variety of fashions, very, very vibrant, uh, whether dealing with the narratives of the Aranda of Central Australia or the Inuit of the Central Arctic whether dealing with the narratives of Christianity, Hinduism, Taoism, or that of science and capitalism. In telling the story, the narrative of Abraham's covenant with the Lord, or Abraham Lincoln's Gettysburg Address, those narratives, the spokes and the hub, have played them out in so many powerful ways. And so again, this evening, I sort of come to you. You have a sense of this theme of the unique and the collective diverse, of that unifying shared in common hub, ubiquitous, universal. Does that resonate with you? Does that play out in your own stories? Are there huckleberries waiting for you? And so I invite you to take a journey. And in my new um, dance regalia, AKA still an ethnographer at heart, um, I am using as my research design the humanities, perfect perfect for this particular exploration and, and job we have ahead of us. Certainly the humanities share with other disciplines like the social sciences and the natural sciences a concern about the human condition, 
making sense of it, understanding our humanity. What distinguishes us is not so much the content. A behavioral psychologist and a playwright and a humanities professor all could be dealing with the same content, but they could be doing it in different ways. And what really distinguishes us, it seems to me, in the humanities is that our approach in the humanities is interpretive. The Idaho Humanities Council talks about, defines the humanities as belonging to certain disciplines like, thank goodness, anthropology, American Indian studies, international studies, various cultural studies, communication, law, languages, literature, history, philosophy, including the reflection and theory in creative writing, the reflection and theory in the performing arts, in the visual arts. And while not a black and white distinction, the humanities methodology is distinct, not a black and white distinction from the social sciences that are very much positivist and empirical as opposed to interpretive, from the arts that are creative from the interpretive. Examples of the humanities method include hermeneutics and literary criticism, phenomenology, and in my own di discipline, thick description. If you look at that term humanities um, as, as interpretive, that focus of humanities as interpretive, to interpret something is to render something meaningful, understandable, to serve, to inform, enlighten, instruct. The word itself derives from 14th century Middle English, from the Latin, someone who serves to mediate, someone who serves to negotiate the origin of the term. So certainly, the interpretive within humanities is to seek new knowledge, new understandings, but then apply it, link it, make it relative, integrate it into people's lives. Just a little bit. Negotiating known and knower. Rendering that knowledge a little empathetic, projecting the knower into the known. The Idaho Humanities Council goes on to suggest that what the humanities uniquely seek is to yield wisdom, wisdom going beyond knowing, to thicken and extend, to apply, to engage in civic life, both locally and globally, to address challenges and the big question. In his 2007 address, Gary Williams, my predecessor, building upon the Massachusetts Foundation for the Humanities statement, emphasized that the humanities are a way of thinking about and responding to the world tools we use to examine and to make sense of the human experience in general, as well as individual experiences in particular. The humanities enable us to reflect upon our lives and ask fundamental questions of value, purpose, meaning in a rigorous, systematic way. So using my intensity and snowball sampling techniques in my major research question, I've gone out and asked you, and as I've done for 30 other faculty members and some 40 students at this university, all Vandal members, what's the interplay between the unique and universal, the particular, the ubiquitous? Does that resonate with you? Does that inform how you relate to people, to others around you, how you go about creating and discovering. This is very much a humanities exploration of our community, the Vandal community. It's coming from our students and, going, and faculty and going back into our community, asking this question. And so I've gone out and asked a few folks, does this resonate? Does this make sense to you? How does this play out? And they've responded in many different ways, different meanings of the unique different meanings for the universal than I've shared this evening, but has still resonated with them. And they've chosen to present their understanding of that interplay in ways distinct from mine. Very distinct from mine. Some will be doing it in performances and dance and music and theater. There'll be exhibits in photography and paintings. There'll be creative writing and playwright readings. There'll be colloquial talks on philosophy and jurisprudence, sociology and religious studies, 
history and public policy, talks on biology and chemistry, computer science and physics, all reflective, all participatory. And so I think that we'll see in so many of these responses implications for us all, for our capacities for communication and collaboration, for creativity in the arts and discovery in the sciences, for tolerance, civility, and respect, for building both local and global community, what I call the five C's. If we're to effectively engage with and understand, to work with members of our community that are so different from ourselves, strangers amongst us, distinguished by divisions of class, ethnicity, religion, cultural differences, distinguished by academic disciplines and theoretical paradigms, distinguished by partisan politics, are not the lessons of the hub and the rim and the spoken just as important? Do we have to wait to be galvanized by some external threat or catastrophe to rediscover what we already know and what we already can do? Can we not embrace the values of inclusion, equality, empathy as easily as Tom and Susie did? Can we not transverse the seemingly mutually exclusive as easily and effectively as Tom and Susie did in their lives? So just posing the questions, join us in this humanities exploration. Let's share some stories, some bai, jiji, wau, perhaps discover some huckleberries, the chart, a course, meet our challenges, and the huckleberries taste pretty good themselves. I want to thank you. It's been a privilege to present Tom's story of the wheel to you. And because it's warm and so appropriate, um, let's not do a Q&A, but retire to the hall where we have huckleberry ice cream waiting for us. Thank you. <laughs>